everybody. Let's get rolling. We got numbers. Oh, no, everybody's piling on now. Nice. Um, so we are going to get rolling here. My friend Lauren, Eric, uh, and I are going to um, take you through a little, a little combo, an integrated approach to fitness and um, something that uh, I have um, been privileged to kind of introduce into my life. I've been, I've been meditating for about five or six years now. My sister's a yoga instructor and a um, meditation coach. She worked at the Chopra Center for 15 plus years and uh, has been a, a big influence on that component for me in my life. But as a resistance trainer and as a coach, our business model, we don't have a lot of time to um, kind of build that into our regular practices. We do some of our mobilities and our stretches and such. So with the time and the availability we have during this kind of uh, universal shutdown, uh, I contacted Lauren and asked her if she would pop in here and do kind of a joint approach with me. Um, something that, that we want to um, kind of emphasize with this is Lauren's gonna be doing live demos. So I'm gonna be flipping the camera back and forth between her and the slides. You will get the PDF slides at the end of the week. I'm gonna do a mass email of all of our presentations to everybody. Uh, I've got 60 to 100 people signed up for each one of these. So I'm just going to email everyone everything at the end rather than trying to kind of pick through and see who wants what. And then you guys can hop into that Dropbox and take whichever ones you want. Uh, but when we go live to her screen, you won't be able to see the slides. Uh, but I will show you the eight exercises for the shoulder and the eight exercises for the hip and all of her cues. She's got all that on there for us. So you will get that afterwards. And then all my exercises we have, I wanted to be able to film this live with you in our studio, uh, but our, our lockdown here in California, we're not really allowed to go down there all that often. Um, so I did video analysis basically of my clients doing it. So you'll get to see those on there as well. Uh, we are open for Q&A at the end. So feel free to click on your tab there, do Q&A. We will not answer those live as we're going. Uh, we'll do them at the end. So we're happy to, to go through that with you. And then uh, as we, Annie Curry says, hello, hi Annie. <laughs> as, we, uh, as we work our way through all the content, uh, even if it's a question from slide number one, throw it on there and we'll revisit those as we go. Sound good? All right, so yoga and resistance training, a little marriage here of the two. Our uh, key note speaker, Lauren Eric. Lauren, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit. Hey Robert, thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure working with you over these past few weeks and I'm very honored to be on your Education Week. <clears throat> I actually am in Louisville, Kentucky, a little further away from you. Mm -hmm. And um, I own a wellness center here called Yoga Integrated Science Wellness Center. We specialize in muscle activation techniques, personal training, yoga therapy, and also group classes. We do yoga, Pilates, and resistance training type group classes. We also have a 500 hour um, teacher training program um, that we specialize in a more anatomically based uh, biomechanics types uh, teacher training that is available for credit through the Yoga Alliance program. So we've been doing that now since about the year 2010, and I've been presenting internationally now since about 1998. So um, I'm really excited to be here. Nice. So well, yeah, thank you for being here. I've been so impressed with your with your content and everything you put out. Uh, we just met a couple, what, two and a half weeks ago, yeah. uh, doing a panel together, and. Um, a lot of our business practices and the, the way we go about things and our research for content and kind of our obsession there of, of the science of things um, really connected with us. And we've uh, grown into a really good friendship here just in a couple of weeks. So the, uh, the COVID shutdown has brought uh, some, some good things uh, to our lives here as well. And uh, for those of you that uh, may be new to the series or have joined from Lauren's uh, following, uh, my name is Robert Linkle. I run a studio here in Sacramento, California uh, that's called Be Stronger Fitness. We target older adults, so as majority of our clientele is over 50. Our average client is 68 years old, and uh, we do small, semi-private group training with them. I work anywhere with six to eight people every hour, and uh, we train upwards of you know 40 people a day when when we are open and going. And uh, as of late, we've been transitioned to an online training program. <laughs> so we talk about that a little bit tomorrow in one of our business talks of how uh, we made the jump of that pretty quickly. And then I also run trainingtheolderadult.com, which is our uh, online education for trainers, coaches, instructors, and such, working with the older populations. We have a course going right now uh, for our, our eight-week course on, on learning our methods and such. So feel free to hop on uh, trainingtheolderadult.com there. And I've got a little special offer for everybody uh, at the end if you have any interest there. All right, so when we look at this, when, when you know, Lauren and I, we kind of talked a, a bit about our approaches and some things that we really like to address with our clientele. And when it really comes down to like the basic nitty gritty for me, the two things that we address with, especially with our older populations the most, 
uh, and it's going to it's going to at least improve, I'd guess, upwards of 80 percent of their limitations uh, or or of, of true injuries that they have is learning how to hip hinge and develop uh, hip strength, mobility, stability, flexibility in the hip, and then same at the shoulder. So we really wanted to kind of address those two areas with you today and to kind of showcase what we're, we're working on. The ultimate goal for me from a strength and, and a resistance component, and as well as a performance ability on one side is, you know, the average person um, through a really good study assessment with the NSCA, uh, we did a, a basic mechanic breakdown of people on a daily basis and they'll perform over 100 hinges a day. That's if you're picking up your shoes, that's a hinge. If you're hinging over to pick up your purse or your keys from a tabletop, that's also a hinge. So we'll perform over 100 of those a day. Knowing that that mechanic is so um, prevalent in what we do every day, we need to make sure that we're performing those mechanics well and we're not over abusing or uh, you know, moving in mechanics that are poor or causing more damage. Um, properly picking things up truly off the floor, not just from a hinge mechanics, but straight off the ground. And then also being able to put them back and or place things up overhead and, and take from overhead. Um, the posture of what we address from the shoulder, you know, rows and presses and carries and, and such. You know, we think about groceries and, and taking those loads from the car into where we're going, their travel bags from the floor up to the overhead compartment, the daily function type movements that we want people to be able to perform well and not have to rely on someone else or on a potential injury occurring. Those are the two really big key goals that we're addressing today is how can we develop great mobility, stability, flexibility with some of the movements Lauren will show you, and then how can we implement some strength components uh, on that end with some of the resistance pieces that we have. So Lauren's going to take the lead here with us. I'm going to throw the camera over to her, and uh, she's going to pop back and demo some of these and take you through some cues. Uh, you are going to see this on your slides, okay? So she has eight exercises she's going to take you through. It'll give you the exercise. Uh, the, the special name for each one of those, which I hope she will enunciate for me, and then all of the cues and components there that you'll address at the end. We have all eight of those listed here for you. Again, you'll get those in the PDF, and then you'll come back with me and we'll go into the shoulder with some exercises there. So Lauren, when you're ready, partner, take it away. I'm ready. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, I just want to start off by saying that what Robert is getting ready to show you after this is going to oh, be- Can we get your camera down, Lauren? Hi. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, keep happen. going, keep going. Yeah, right there. There you go, Ben. Perfect. All right. Okay. So um, again, what Robert is getting ready to show you is going to be a lot of applying external loads to the body to strengthen the shoulder, which is extremely important in my teacher training program. We stress so much the importance of muscle muscle contraction. And also the strength of the core is being paramount, especially to the aging population. So I'm gonna show you eight different things that you can do with your clients. This can be done as a warm up. It can also be done as a precursor to a lot of strength training methodology. So first thing I wanna show you here is called the cat pose, which is called chakra vakasana. It doesn't matter if you know that or not, but just so that you know the Sanskrit name. You're basically in all fours. A lot of clients have a difficult time getting down their knees. You can easily put a blanket down. You can double fold a mat. There's all kinds of ways around that. You can also do this from a standing position placing your hands in the fronts of your legs, but you're basically stacking your shoulder over the wrist. The reason for that is that you want some sort of neutrality, some sort of a balance here. If I had my hands out here, obviously, it would freeze that moment arm across the trunk and it would cause me to collapse into extension a lot more. So coming into this balance position is a nice place to start. So we're thinking about shoulder mobility. Um, a lot of times we think about, especially with yoga, you can't not talk about the core when you're talking about the position of the scapula. So the first thing I want to show you is protraction, retraction. So with the cat pose, we are actually rounding the back like a cat. Now, obviously, this is working against gravity. We can also increase our load by actually pushing our hands together. And by pushing the hands together, this performs scapular protraction. Not only will it, will it cause protraction at the shoulder, it's also going to really enhance spinal flexion. And I can also add a little bit more friction by pulling my hands towards my feet, really getting a lot of those abdominal muscles into play. Countering that, we move into the next pose, Bidilasana, which is actually the cow pose. And you can see this is extension. A lot of people are going to have a difficult time looking at this. I suggest looking at this before you put your clients on a lot of different exercises, just testing out their lumbosacral mobility. 
So as you exhale, we're flexing into the cat pose. And as you inhale, we're going into the cow pose. And you can see if I push my hands apart, meaning this way, it caused the scapular retraction, right? And that's gonna enhance a lot of my extension piece and my spine, which again is gonna help you to set that scapula, especially when you're getting ready to do any kind of rowing or overhead pulling type of motion. So moving in the time with the breath is great. From there, I like to try to get clients to find a position of neutral, which I always define with them is a position where we don't have too much stress in any one area, right? So if, it, if I'm between a position of flexion and extension, I can start doing what we call is the bird dog exercise. And the bird dog is called Parjwa Balasana. And as you inhale, we're taking one leg straight back, so we're in hip extension. That's gonna automatically tell you a lot about that person's ability to maintain that trunk position. So it's pushing me into trunk rotation. I'm having to use a lot of my trunk rotators to stop that from moving. Then when I counter that with shoulder flexion, notice that a lot of my shoulder flexors are gonna be under the, the influence of gravity. So it's kind of an interesting way to treat that. A lot of times we work with our clients, we're just doing these types of things in the warm up, but you can realize gravity is running straight through my arm. Here, when I'm in this exercise, I'm actually resisting gravity with the mass of my arm and contralaterally pushing a lot of that load into the opposing hip. This is a great exercise to do. A lot of times I'll start with the client where it's going kind of slow and having to hold that position, sort of assessing if there's a lot of wobbling around. And then eventually you might want to move into more of a cadence where you can move back and forth and just test that person's ability to control that. For a little variation, you can move into shoulder abduction, hip abduction, which has put a little bit of stress on the lateral flexors as well in the spine. And then what I like to do with my clients is add a little variation. I'll just show you. If I flex my knee and extend my hip, I can actually depress and retract my shoulder, perform a little rotation in my trunk, and just kind of reach back and see if I can actually, can, couldn't find it there, if I can actually take my foot. And a lot of people, lever lengths, uh, genetics, all that's gonna take into consideration. At the same time, I can do the same thing from underneath by coming into that cat pose, by adding that knee to opposite elbow, which is gonna get a lot more of my spinal flexors in play, all right? So next, I want to show you the common exercise that I think a lot of you will always think of as plank. I could talk to you a long time about plank and what I think about plank, um, but it's become the quintessential exercise, especially for everybody locked in, everyone's doing planks. It's basically essentially spinal neutral. So if I'm hitting my shoulders directly above my um, wrist bones and my feet directly across from my hips, this is general plank. Obviously, I'm getting pushed into extension, so I'm working a lot of my spinal flexors. But the nice thing about shoulder mechanics, I can do a lot of frictional forces to really warm up the shoulder to get ready for some strength training, for instance. If I'm holding plank and I'm shoving my hands together, I'm gonna to be moving into protraction, working my chest muscles. If I'm pushing my hands apart, I'm gonna work into retraction, which I'm working a lot of my retracting muscles. If I push my hands forward, I'm not only pushing myself into extension of my trunk, but I'm also working with the elevators of my shoulder, as I'm pulling my hands towards my feet, I'm not only coming into a flex spine if I'm not controlling it, I'm working into scapular depression. Now we know that the next, the next position that you a lot of times will see is this hovering motion, which we know in fitness as the shoulder push-up or the tricep push-up, if I want to decrease that moment arm from front to back, I could actually lower down onto my knees. That way I have less trunk stabilization. But again, this variation will really put a lot more stress, particularly on my shoulder flexors, if I'm kind of moving in this particular motion. It's gonna increase the moment on both at my shoulder as well as my elbow. So it's nice to get that tricep going. We know that the long head of that tricep is a big, powerful shoulder extensor. So it's nice to kind of work that into your position. And I think for a lot of people, especially your older adults, being on your wrist is gonna be a challenge for them. So if you're going to do these kind of exercises, you might want to consider rolling the mat up so that I can limit my wrist extension. That way I don't have to come into that 90 degree position. And then also I would almost always, especially for females and males too, um, they don't have a lot of upper body strength, I would almost always have them come down on their knees when they're a little older. And then you can limit how far down you go, right? Because the further I go, you can see my elbows coming further and further and further from my base of support and then obviously the risk is, is developing that sort of protracted position. Um, from there, I'm talking kind of fast, I know that I'm trying to get done so that Robert can get on. 
is going to be my cobra pose. Now, one thing I want to caution about these cobra poses and, and back bends, what we call in fitness, a lot of your clients that have these postural issues that Robert's going to be talking to you about, where we sort of have this sort of rounded posture, the moment I go supine, or excuse me, prone on the floor, I've already maxed out my range. So for a lot of my clients, I'll actually put a blanket down right under the hips. So in a little bit of hip flexion, I'll kind of demonstrate, I would be more like this off the floor. So that now my upper body is actually hanging forward. If you guys have BOSU balls or resistor balls in your facility where someone can actually drape over the ball, moving from a, from a really rounded position up into neutral, that might be a better option. But as far as with the Cobra goes, I'm gonna actually flex my elbows, place my palms down beside me. I wanna press down into the floor with my hips into hip extension. And then from here, I'm just gonna keep my chin tucked and work on extension through the torso. But the cool thing about the shoulder is they're gonna go along right with it, right? So I can isometrically pull my hands towards my hips, which would be driving me into scapular depression, right? And that would actually help me move also into retraction of the scapula. This is a great exercise. A lot of the problems that we see with forward head and forward shoulder syndromes or just lack of spinal extension strength, right? So this is a great pose. I like to add variations such as adding trunk rotation. So maybe I might wanna do something like I could either have my elbows fully extended or elbows flexed. And as I come up, I could add that rotation which would actually drive a little bit more into that retraction. But remember, I'm working 100% against gravity. So it's gonna be much harder on the ground than it would be standing up. From there, I can move into what we call bala, uh, the Shalabhasana in yoga, which is the locust pose. The locust pose is just adding the extremities to the mix, right? So in the locust pose, I might try something where I have my shoulders in full flexion, and then when I elevate my torso, I would actually go just like the bird dog exercise, going opposite arm to leg from here, right? In classic uh, locust pose in yoga, a lot of times it's bilateral, so I'm actually lifting both of my legs at once. I don't have a lot of hip extension, but some people do. And I could either be from here, right? I could move in, into the classic PT position where I go from the I position to the Y position to the I position, maybe even back down here, or maybe even all the way down by my side. In doing that, I have direct load into the back of my shoulder as I move into all these different positions, working completely against gravity. So trying some of those, I think, would be really helpful, especially if I was now going to have someone do some sort of a loaded exercise where I was pulling something towards me. I want to make sure that these postural muscles are really working hard. You can do these same exercises from standing and bending backwards. I'm kneeling right now, but I could be standing up. But realize gravity is assisting me now, so I'm not going to be resisting my shoulders as much as I would be when I'm prone to the floor. So Robert, I'm going to hand it over to you. Awesome. Excellent job. The, uh, the thing I was, I'm impressed with the content, but I'm really impressed of the last couple of days I've been trying to teach classes and talk at the same time. And it is so difficult to be able to do what you just did and like talk at a normal, <laughs> regular tension and, 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 you know, at a level and not sound like you're gassed and my breath is all shaky. And so that was, that was <laughs> thank you. Good. Mark. I don't know about so, that, but thank you. <laughs> All right, so moving on to some uh, scapular retraction, posterior chain resistance training exercises. I've got uh, these little tutorials here that we've seen. And Lauren, if you wanna bring your camera up there just a little bit, bud, we'll be able to see you. Um, we have these, these little series here on YouTube. I did this with Dr. John Russin, and it's a full series of like the 10 commandments, as we call it, the 10 strategies that we would implement working with older populations. And I have two of them, one specific to the shoulder and one specific to the hip. And they're four or five minutes long and it really emphasizes and kind of, kind of dives deeper into uh, the retracting component of all the rowing actions that we do and all the different anchor points and anchor heights uh, is really a big one for us. Knowing the individuals that we're gonna be working with and knowing that there's gonna be these limitations from structural issues like separated AC joints or labral tears with a lot of the older populations, they're not gonna fix those limitations. A lot of our clients are due or would greatly benefit from a shoulder replacement, but they're 80 something years old and they're, and they're just not gonna do it for them. So basically we're trying to work the best we can with what we've got. And with, with our, our older pops kind of working 
for decades now in this forward position, forward head, where we're going to do as much retractability strength training as possible, but it's not just all about retraction. We still have to have protraction, retraction, mobility, and range of motion that we want to build in there. So a lot of the key components we're going to have here are going to be this Elizabeth. She's, you know, in her early mid forties, somewhere in there, but really has a great demonstration of how much we're allowing in the rowing actions, the protraction of the scapula to come out, to rotate, to retract and come back. And we're engaging this range under tension, not allowing the band to just go to extension and then relax, right? So I don't want the joints to go slack. I want you to always have tension, but to work through a really great range of, of motion. Some of the uh, limitations that we're going to experience as well are going to be arthritic issues with the hands and the wrist. So some of the modifications that I like to showcase here are um, some alternate grips that we have. Uh, these are like little tricep extension handles that you can hook onto cables or pulleys. And uh, as um, you know, we're able to have Karen pull through these actions here, we're working open hand extension grips which are gonna work on all the extensors of the back of the hand, uh, anti-flexion, anti-overgrip strength, which is basically what we do with every other exercise. We grip and rip on everything else. So as many modifications as we can make where we can put their hands in the opposite direction, like with so, you can adjust these handles or these actions on almost all of these rows by adding an attachment here or simply placing your hands through the band and opening up what we call like a reverse push-up kind of position. So that was a high anchor. You see a horizontal row. Um, we call these chest pulls. Uh, the rest of the industry calls them face pulls. I'm not a big fan of pulling things directly to the face, especially if you're using bands. You know, there's some safety issues there. We check our bands constantly on a daily basis, and we're always checking for wear and tear. But you really want to emphasize everything, in my opinion, pulling to the chest. And as rows go from these angles, the palm up is going to be the most comfortable position for the shoulder. It externally rotates. It allows for a good, you know, circumduction rotation as you row. Neutral grip uh, would be a little bit more difficult and then eventually a pronated grip. It does feed or tend to lean towards impingements if your client has that. So pronated grips can be a little touchy. It just depends on the person you're working with. And then a low anchor point row. Uh, Jerry's adding in a little complex here where we're doing a full squat into a pronated row here. So all three of these high, medium, or low anchors I always want you to think about the opposite end anchor point of where you're pulling from. If your clients have high neck tension issues up in the upper trap, the occipital and such, then having low anchor points are probably gonna aggravate them. If you take a look at Jerry here, the purple band of pulley, this direct load is pulling opposite, okay, from his neck and his upper trap area. So that's gonna be a direct relation or a counterweight for him to try to resist. And if that's his problem area, we're gonna aggravate that. So with Jerry, if that were the issue, I would do this, the middle one, the horizontal row or the high anchor. And that's gonna work more into low rhomboid, you know, lat and, and uh, long head of the tricep, posterior delt and such to work in there. So kind of keep those things in mind when you're working your way through your poles with your clients. Think about the angles, the opposite angles, some of their limitations, you know, what areas you might be able to address. I'm not big on plugging uh, certain products unless I really, really believe in it. And these angle 90 grips are Italian handles and they've been a total game changer for us. So any, any of the handles that you're going to implement over a band is going to be more comfortable for clients, especially as they get older um, skin. And this is proven. This isn't just one of those myths. Their skin does get thinner. It gets more sensitive. And even if they're doing wear and tear and yard work and that kind of stuff on a daily basis, um, it still can be very uncomfortable for them. So attaching a handle, we use carabiners like high quality mountaineering carabiners mm -hmm. to click our handles onto the bands. Um, they're very smooth. They're not going to wear away on the bands. They're geared for 800 to 1,000 plus pounds, you know, so you don't have to worry about them bending or breaking. And then you can attach them to almost anything, right? So in these angle pulls here, again, a high and a low anchor. Um, we have these little cable pulleys uh, from Spud Incorporated that you can adjust and move pretty much anywhere in the gym. We'll counterweight them with, you know, a 40-pound sandbag. And you'll also notice she's got a resistance band on the back. So as she's increasing her range pulling, it's getting tighter and, and harder and heavier. And then as she comes forward and lets the tension out, it gets a little easier. So a lot of scapular retraction, a lot of action going in the shoulder blades here. That big squeeze, the big proud Superman chest at the top. We really emphasize that fingertip to chest or elbows wrapped around the ribs, just really finishing that pull as high as possible. 
And then with our low anchors here, um, this is just a simple anchor point with two resistant bands off the floor. So you don't really even need pulleys sometimes. You just need an anchor, anchor position to put them into. Um, Linda is 70, 68, 70 years old. Look at those arms. I, I wish I could say I had something to do with those, but she had those before we started training. But 15 years I've been working with Linda. And these little, we call these row your boats. This is a true kind of a hinge forward action where we're creating a range of motion. We're using our momentum to help us. But once she gets the band back there, she's eccentrically letting it out slower than her, her concentric action coming in. So if I'm going to cheat a little bit and use momentum to get it back there, I want to work a little harder on the other side, kind of like doing negative reps, right? Um, Arnold famously said, if you're going to cheat to make something more difficult, it's not really cheating, it's a benefit, right? So we kind of implement that same strategy uh, with our row actions. And this is called a pivot point. I have two or three uh, webinars on YouTube that explain these, so I won't go into those too deep, but working your body's levers against a lever is a huge, huge perk. So this is a 35 pound kettlebell with one of our awesome handles on there, the angle 90 handles, plus a resistance band. So she's able to work through a range of motion. She doesn't have to worry about stabilizing the weight because it's on a pivot, it's on the strap, but she has a consistent load plus a rubber band in there that she's engaging, making it more difficult, harder to close. Ruth is my longest tenured client, 16 years I've been working with her. And, and pretty much every day we do a little something different to challenge her. So that's a very good one there. And then Gary here, high anchor row, again, a little row your boat. Notice how quick he comes down in that slow eccentric out, heave the weight back, chest up, pop it in there, let it out really, really slow. He's got three bands on there working a big resistance. That's a big eccentric load these working against here okay so eccentrics are great for building strength for working on these postural movements uh, they're they're a good emphasis that you can incorporate into your training strategies with some of the same actions you already do just changing the tempos maybe a three second or even a four second negative can be pretty challenging and then some of these complexes once your clients have mastered some of these other actions these other pulls complexes are a great cognitive component a mental training component to incorporate in here too you know we're working a high angle pull with rotation you know while doing an alternating arm press overhead you can also work into a standing position with a horizontal row okay this is the the monkey see monkey do you know rub your belly tap your head kind of action and you can see people really struggle with the you know the the coordination to coordinate and to perform these movements to manipulate these movements and uh, once they kind of get the rhythm down and get the action down we do a lot of actions not necessarily just like this in life but we'll be rowing and pushing one thing at the same time or grabbing and twisting at the same time and so we do want to kind of incorporate some of these these actions these mobilities with our clients as we can uh, 45 degree angle row with a lateral raise okay uh, Mary's cranking these out. We definitely could have made this a little harder for her, but you see some of the the coordinated efforts that we can put in just to make things a tiny bit, you know, more challenging, a little bit more uh, coordinated on our clients end to um, provide a consistent challenge, something new, something intriguing, cognitively challenging for them, but with the a mindset of uh, I have to look at their limitations and see what angles I want to anchor their resistance from, what kind of uh, ascending, descending tensions I want them to work with, and then being able to address all this right around that scapular action to make sure we're addressing their limitations, right? So we're going to have some different pains or some different impingements or limitations. Little tiny changes from hand position, angle, and heights can help you overcome those and really integrate that into your client success as they you know kind of work their way through their their shoulder improvements so that bit kind of wraps up our shoulder action here I'm gonna let go let Lauren go back into this now um, with the hip activations here and again we have the one two uh, three four five six seven eight different ex exercises she's gonna take you through uh, I'll throw it back to you Lauren if you want to tip your camera back down there bud and you're ready to roll yeah, I'm going to wait and make sure this is good. That looks about right. Yeah, I think you're good there. All right. So um, just kind of watching what, what uh, Robert was saying there, I do, I do think that there's a point that I need to make about the differences between what he's doing and what I'm doing, just so that you all get it. Um, there's a lot of research now that's coming out of the industry about the value of isometric training. Um, you know, sometimes when we're you know, obviously working out at a gym, we tend to, and I've been a part of this group my whole life, the, the eccentric, concentric, you know, moving a position and exercise is about a rep. Yoga is a little different. I think there's a lot of people out there that look at, at yoga as like, I'm going to do a flexibility exercise. 
<clears throat> what we're essentially doing in yoga is we're taking the person to the end of their range of their joint. As we age, this availability to move actually uh, makes it get a lot smaller. So as we take someone in their end range, the idea of what I'm showing you with all these exercises, I'll try to be more clear about it, is that we want to make sure that that person, when they get into these vulnerable positions, the resistance may need to be a little bit lower. That's the definition of an isometric. For the weight not to have its way with me and move me, I have to be able to come up with enough resistance to counter it. So we know that the definition of an isometric is no change in length. And while we're holding some of these positions I'm going to show you, we want to really concentrate with our clients about making sure they're doing a lot of deep diaphragmatic breathing so that they can really be conscious of their core, stabilizing, meaning not moving their core. We want to hold a lot of the positions that I'm going to show you for at least five to six seconds before we switch. You know, it's a lot of Roberts. We're kind of going in and out, which is traditional strength training. But these two things, when they marry together, you'll actually give your clients more control over the weight that they're moving. They'll actually have more of an idea of where their shoulders are, where their trunks are, their trunk position is currently, and also how to control their hips a little better, which is really essential when we're talking about older populations, when we're thinking about falling and losing their balance and chronic pain and issues like that. So as we start with this, um, one thing that Robert had said to me, he said, can we please do something about hips in terms of bending over and people having issues with tightness in the backs of their legs and that causing some chronic um, anterior hip pain as well as problems with standing on one leg and actually rotating. So these particular exercises I think will be very comfortable. I'm gonna start with a really, com uh, really common one. This is the supine knee to chest pose. Apanasana. And with this is a lot of people will use this. I'm sure a lot of your clients will use it at the end of the session. Well, they'll take their knee into their chest and they'll grab it and they'll just pull, right? And so if you notice, when I take my leg up on its own, this is as far as I'm going to go. Now I'm gravity assisted, so the weight of my leg is pulling me down. But the goal of this exercise, if I was going to tell you, I want to improve the contractile ability of my hip flexor so that someone can bend over a little bit better. So one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to place my hands as soon as I notice this is as far as I go. I'm going to place my hands on my shins and I'm going to tell my client now to push their leg up into my hand. Hmm. Now, if I'm pushing up, let's say that hand wasn't there and I'm holding this for five or six seconds. If my hand wasn't there, my leg would do this, which is knee extension, hip extension, really. So as I'm coming up, I'm actually putting some real good strengthening exercises into, for instance, rectus femoris, muscles that are, uh, excuse me, not rectus femoris, biceps femoris, we're actually trying to work a lot of our quadricep muscles, also the, the vastus intermedius, it's a great exercise for that as well. And these are our gravity fighters. And by the same token, I can even tell my, my clients, once they have their hands here, to direct them, okay, take your leg and pull it away from your hand. So I'm trying to actually engage my hip flexors. Sometimes I might actually have them use a prop. I use a lot of these small uh, little Pilates balls, but you can use just about anything. Anything to fill up that joint space, you can see that now I'm actually pushing into something. So now I'm improving my contractile range. You can progress this by going to a longer lever where that person is actually extending their knee. And you'll see with a lot of the older populations, they may be more like this on the floor. So you may have to put something underneath their head and bring them into spinal neutral. And then for them to be able to raise their leg, a lot of times, especially with gentlemen, they won't get their leg up very far. They've been sitting in chairs, their knees have never had to bend beyond 90 degrees, and so there's a lot of chronic adaptive shortening that goes on in those tissues. So if that's the case, gravity is going to be enough, right, just to work on getting that leg straight, and people will really struggle with trying to maintain spinal stability while this leg is here. But if you do get that occasional client that has a lot more range of motion, you can see that now I'm essentially balanced. Gravity's running straight through my leg. So I might need to use like a block. You know, this is just a yoga block where I can place this block on the front of my shin. And as I block that leg as it's coming in, I'm getting a lot of great hip flexor work as well as a lot of abdominal stabilization. It's going to be a huge assistance to me as I start to have my clients, you know, bend over and do squatting motions and lunging motions. As a variation as well to add intensity, remember, I could add spinal flexion to really bring in some of these trunk muscles because we know in daily life, the trunk and the hip are gonna to work together to perform hip flexion nine times out of 10. For a great counter pose exercise, we move into the bridge pose, which is called safety bandhas, and that means the supine bridge. Bandha means lock in yoga, right? So we're locking things. 
I'm going to come into knee flexion, hip flexion, scapular retraction. So we're still bringing in that shoulder, right? And then we're in trunk extension. So from here, assuming my client can get to this position, right? I'm going to perform hip extension. Now, this is wonderful. Your older populations, I tell my yoga teacher training students this all the time, prioritize the hip, right? Falling and breaking your hip is one of the leading causes of death for our aging population. And these are the areas that really need to work more than anything, right? So we went from the front of the hip to the back of the hip, and you can see how complementary these exercises can really be. So as I come into hip extension, right, my head, capital spine pushing into extension, but my cervical spine is from the floor being pushed into flexion. I'm also pushing into extension. So it can be really nice for the neck, assuming that client can get there. That's also going to give me something like the floor to push against to really drive that retraction of the scapula. And I'm getting a lot of great work down my back, which is really going to help with a lot of these posterior muscles in the hip. Now, as I push those hips up to the ceiling, I am targeting my gluteus maximus, right? Big important area. If you're going to do anything with your clients, work on those glutes, right? I'm sure Robert will tell you the same thing. Yeah, he's, he's giving me a thumbs up right now. So as I'm coming into this position, first, just body weight is the first place I want to go. But there's so much you can do in an isometric to really fire up these muscles. For instance, what if I tell my client to pull their feet back towards their shoulders? Now I'm getting a resistance profile into knee flexion, hip extension. I'm bringing in those hamstrings, right? I could also do the opposite. I can push my feet away from me, especially if I have a client with a lot of potentially a uh, degenerative disc in the lower back, which is so common with this group, right? I'm now putting the pressure on the front of my legs, pushing into knee extension and taking some of the stress off the back while still being able to train glute. Now, if you want to bring in a lot more spinal rotation, I advise you to try to work on maybe lifting one foot. First, I say to people, give yourself the intention. Don't actually lift your leg yet. Give yourself the intention. And over time, as I lift the leg, I can go from a shorter lever to a longer lever to a greater lumbar arm, so I'm actually picking up more mass, and I'm also training a lot of this trunk rotation. But again, while I'm holding these, and I neglected to say that before, you want to hold these for five or six seconds without moving, hmm. focusing on the breath, focusing on control, and you're going to see their squats and lunges explode in the gym, right? Okay, so from there, as we come back up, coming out of that, we want to move into what's called the chair pose, okay? So I'm just going to stand up now. I hope you can see me full screen, right? Okay. Yes. So squatting, I'm sure, you know, Robert's going to tell you a lot about squatting and how to squat properly. There's many different ways to squat in yoga as well. They all have different names. But, you know, with people sitting all the time, we think they're really good at sitting. They're not, right? Just because we're plopped in a chair doesn't mean that we're good at sitting. So when we come into a sitting posture, before you ever put your client on a weight or pick up dumbbells, we want to assess how do they squat? How do their segments fold up, right? We do a whole thing in our teacher training seminar. We spend days on watching people squat. So when we think about going into a squat, typically in yoga, we have this sort of parallel position, which we know not everyone can get into, right? Depending on the length of my femur, length of the tibia, length of the trunk. And then I'm just practicing a seated posture. And I'm just allowing that person to see how their segments fold up. And you may see these types of things, you might see knees collapsing, people unable to control supination and pronation of the foot. But just holding this for a moment, watching how they fold up, seeing how far they go, and can they stay there, right? Once I'm here, I can work on a couple of things. I could work on potentially shifting my weight anteriorly, working more into the front of the foot, shifting posteriorly, working to the back. And that's gonna bring in the front and back of my body. It's also gonna train my quadriceps or my glutes depending on how far I move forward or back. And we do a lot of things in yoga where we're playing around with lever lengths. You can see with my arms, right? And so as I'm coming up into the squatting position, if I'm trying to sit back really far, I'm targeting my lower back. You can see gravity is right above my lower back. As I start to move more forward, you can see, and of course, this is a tough pose, but as I come into ankle plantar flexion and I bring myself, it looks like a sissy squat, right? So I'm really hitting those knee extensors as well. From there, I can practice shifting from one side to the next. Shifting to the right, noticing how well I squat on the right, holding that for five or six seconds, standing back up, shifting to the left, doing the same thing, eventually progressing towards that one-legged squat, and then eventually progressing more towards a lunge. And there's lots and lots of lunging postures in yoga where we can actually play around with how I push my feet into the mat, 
tightening that back glute. So I've got a combination of hip flexion as well as hip extension. This is oftentimes in yoga referred as a split squat, right? Because we're lunging apart. And then we're doing various things. For instance, this might be warrior one, which is gonna bring in trunk extension with hip extension, right? All right, so the next one I wanna show you is gonna be uh, the tree pose, right? Tree pose is great for the older adult population. Um, the, the tree pose is essentially learning how to stand on one leg. Tree pose in yoga is called Vriksasana. Lauren, can you take your camera up just a little bit, Ben? Sure, I can pull this up. Yeah, just like two inches would be perfect. Thanks, Ben. Does that feel better? Perfect. All right, perfect. Sorry, but we've got a little makeshift table here. No, no worries. All right. So first of all, whenever we think about standing on one leg, especially with the older population, it's different to stand on it for a minute, but it's, it's difficult to stand on something when you're holding it for five or six seconds. It's a totally different ballgame. So I always tell my clients, start standing on the floor without your shoes before you start standing on wobbly devices, right? So if I'm standing on one leg, I'm working on hip abduction, right? Because if gravity had its way with me, I would collapse into hip adduction. So just standing on one leg and bringing in these nice abductor muscles that we need, this is the one reason why a lot of these people, as you know, are gonna fall and break their hip. So as I'm standing in here, I'm just playing around with being able to bring my foot even into this position. Then I'm gonna externally rotate my hip, which is so important when we think about working with the senior population, right? Getting a lot of these gravity fighting muscles to become stronger, right? So from here, if I feel like I have my balance, and I usually give people chairs to work with so they can kind of work with that, I can work on maybe picking up the foot, maybe resting the toe on the floor or going to here. A lot of times you'll see people in yoga to sort of grab their foot and place it and just kind of hang out here. The way that we teach it is we tell people you've got to own the position first before you can just do that kind of stuff. So really, my position for me, that's as far as I can flex my knee and flex my hip. So this is where I'm going to perform the pose. Then it becomes, where do I push? Pulling the foot towards the groin, engaging my core, lifting the chest, holding this, right? And it's a wonderful pose too because it's almost like a standing meditation which will really help people with their anxiety and their stress becoming more mindful. That will translate directly into the gym as far as them really paying attention to how their exercises are actually being executed. Now in the tree pose, right, we can play around with the upper extremities. If you want to bring in some trunk extension, we can, I don't know if you can see me full screen, but I have my arms over my head. You can do these types of things, right? And this is really going to train because I'm working with gravity, right, those hip flexors. Last pose I want to show you is going to be Utita Hasta Padmasthasana, which means holding the big toe pose. We're not going to hold the big toe. A lot of times I'll have people grab like a yoga strap and that you believe, wouldn't believe how heavy your leg is, right? Really. So if I take my leg and I pick it up off the floor, so I'm in hip flexion, knee flexion, and if I place the strap underneath it, it takes some of the load off of my leg. I can play around with them with just trying to lift their foot off the strap and then trying to push down into the strap, holding that for five or six seconds. From there, assuming my standing hip can actually work, I can work on extending my knee, which is the classic pose, right? Now the extension of that knee, this long lever is driving my center of mass more towards the rear part of me, which is bringing in a lot of my posterior muscles, right? From here, I can work towards, this is B position, hip abduction. So now these standing hip muscles have to really hold and fire and react to what's happening over here, which we really want to train with seniors, reactivity, how do I change my center of mass and not lose my balance, right? Then from there, coming back to the center, I can even play around with rotating my trunk over my leg, so I'm actually working with hip internal rotation. So hopefully we've been over a hip external, internal extension, flexion, all those good things, standing on one leg. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Robert now, thank you. Fantastic, thank you. You uh, you crushed the glute bridge, and that's um, we we didn't rehearse this, Lauren and I. We, we kind of went through. She sent me her clips, and we went through it together. I had no idea what she was going to present. I wanted to leave that to her. And um, sometimes you you get into this, and you find that you're actually teaching different strategies with with your clients. And she and I are right on pace, especially with the hip. There's there's been so many different techniques for teaching bridging components with rolling the spine up and down and active and external breathing, belly breathing, all this. And it's, you know, when, when you're looking at, 
isometrically holding some of these and getting in the right spot, structurally sound positions. That's, you know, the, the ideal position, in my opinion, it sounds like Lauren's opinion, to be able to keep your people in those spots. And these isometric holds are difficult. Um, you know, we, that's why I, I say like, how, how it's awesome that you can talk while you're going through these because they're challenging just to hold them alone, let alone keep your composure as you're speaking and going through it. Um, but with, with that all in mind, the, the actions then we want to place into the weight room, the resistance components as we come into that. This is that, that same uh, clip I was telling you about earlier, all on, on YouTube here. They're all free for you to check out. This is probably one of my favorite uh, hip hinging actions. These are with the NT loops. You can use super bands, you know, whatever you want to use with your clients here, uh, where you're going to allow the, the band itself to help pull you back into kind of like a traction hinge is what I call it. And we're teaching our clients hip displacement, teaching them a position that they are learning what it's like to move their hips away, their pelvis away, and then forward rather than rounding at the spine. I, I call it swimmer hip. If you ever work with swimmers, uh, they do so many flutter kicks and so much hamstring work. They're so tight in their hip flexors and hamstrings, they can't unlock their pelvis. All they can do is just round over at the spine. And, and that along with majority of them going through, you know, puberty as they're growing, their bodies are at all these different lengths and they're growing pains and all this. And it's just the most awkward thing to kind of teach. But when you get with the older populations, they've gone through that whole thing, but they've either done so limited, you know, actions or movements to this point that they don't know what it's like to hip hinge and they're just locked down there or they're capable of doing it. They're just not good at it. They're not strong. So we have to build those strengths in there and allowing that band to kind of pull them back into a displacement, into a stretch, but the band gets lighter. And then as they more or less do like a standing hip thrust or return to the standing position vertical, there's enough tension where their glutes are on, their hips are on to engage with them. Uh, but they're not just counter leaning and like inertially leaning against it, right? They're getting some gluteal activation when they go through that. So Lauren nailed the floor bridge, one of my absolute favorites. Uh, I call this a self-anchored bridge and with the feet elevated. And if you can instruct your clients to get to a point where they're capable of doing this with either a, a four or six inch elevation or up to I'd say maybe 12 inches at most, the, this band here, you guys know the little mini bands you can get from Perform Better or from Spry or Power Systems, whoever. Our old bands, we replace those every eight weeks. So our old ones, we loop three of them together and we make this long band. And so this is, you'll see a knot right there. And then there's another knot over here. Those are three mini bands looped. Since we can't use them in the weight room anymore because they're starting to get worn out, we don't want them to break on our clients. We'll loop them together and use them for this, for some self anchor. So I get external rotation at the shoulder. I'm getting that activation like Lauren was talking about, pulling the band down into the floor, arms down in. So really they're floor anchored with really good posture, that good Superman chest up. The rhomboids are active to anchor. You're digging, just like she said, you're digging your heels down into the box and we'll actually cue people in the beginning to try to tip the box over towards them because that's really gonna activate that hamstring glute gastro. And you'll see people the first time they do it, that's why I was, I was pumping Lauren when she was doing it, giving her the thumbs up. You'll see it like sniper their hamstring and they'll grab at it, right? And they're like, whoa, I've never, they, they're so quad dominantly pushing when they bridge or when they bridged in the past. And now that they've learned how to pull up into a glute bridge, it's a whole new ball game. So it's, it's exciting to see it because I'm like, here it comes. Here's the first time they're going to do it. And then the sniper and it gets them and you're like, yeah, that's what I'm looking for, right? That's the action that we need. So that's a floor-based hinge or a floor-based bridge that we want to kind of integrate with our clients, especially with that resistance if you can. Some of the other practices, these are the ones we do in our warm-ups and our mobilities, just a, a real simple wall hinge. Uh, Evan Osar is a real good friend of mine, and he, he teaches a lot of these great, you know, mobility corrective exercises. And uh, so I, I got everybody in my group to come back and do it at once so I could take a video. Normally, there's just two or three of them back there, but hands placed at, you know, shoulder height, maybe a little bit lower. And then they're physically pushing into the wall with their upper half while displacing their hips back, kind of sticking their tush up in the air to work that release of the hamstrings, the opening, the, the shoulder blades coming together, the long uh, erectors in the back. And then this is, a, this is a triple band activation here. Same displacement one I showed you with me in the video earlier, uh, but Lynn will have a band around her knees and one around the, sh the elbows here. So she'll have a retraction of the band of the upper half pulling apart. She'll be resisting, getting some abduction at the knee, at the hip, 
to get the glutes to fire a little more and having the band breaking at the, at the hip in the middle. So really we're firing like everything on the posterior chain to help into this hip hinge mechanic, which is something we would progress up to as we start to add load, right? Here's Steve doing one of those floor anchors again, a little bit heavier band, but with a band around his knee as well. Steve was pre-hip replacement in this, so this was a, a good key component for us to kind of work on these progressive loads that got harder and easier for him as we went up. And then our clients, when we feel comfortable taking them uh, from floor base with some kind of resistance to a vertical, this is one of the first exercises we'll teach them. This is called a deloaded hinge. And, and the band itself is looped over a pull-up bar ahead. This is a 20 pound band at double, uh, gives about a 40 pounds of pressure of a deload. So as she's hinging, she's pushing her knees apart against that band. She has a valgus collapse. She was diagnosed with gluteal amnesia with our PT. So she has no idea how to work her butt, right? Or how to activate it. So we put that band on to get the hips to fire, the glutes, AV ductors, all three to go. And then as she sits into this hinge, she's basically driving her hips uh, backwards while pushing the band down, but not bending over, hinging. And if she's, you know, 130 pounds and that band is 40 pounds of resistance at its lockout, she's about 90 pounds of pure pressure through her body at the bottom. So we're deloading her, allowing her spine to work through a deeper range of motion that she would typically not be able to do or wouldn't be comfortable or would be at, kind of at risk of hurting herself if you know, she didn't have something to engage against and something to make her lighter. So that's one of my favorite ones to do as we go vertical. And then some of the other ones here, these are self anchored, as I call them, meaning we're looping the band under the feet. Uh, Todd is post knee surgery here, so still has his brace on, but we get this deload at the bottom. We, we call these retraction shrugs. So there's no rotation in the shoulder. There's no up in the shoulder. It's just a, a strict retract pullback. So we kind of get into that little Superman chest at the top. And all of these cues for the upper body activation, the shoulder blades and such are feeding towards our ultimate deadlift, right? To be able to keep the backside active while we're doing. So I'll play videos like this with Jerry doing a strict hinge. Jerry's had uh, a hip replacement and knee replacement, needs a shoulder replacement. He's a cancer survivor, still going through treatment. Like guys got all kinds of stuff on his list, right? So when people watch that, they're like, it's not, it's not the perfect hinge. His back is an ex I get that. It's so much better than it was, right? So knowing where he was, we weren't able to do any of this in the beginning, let alone with weight. He was on the deloads before, right? Using the bands from above. So we're building mechanics, doing the best with what we have. But I know the guy's got to pick his shoes up. The guy's got to get his groceries out of the right? So we got to train him to the best mechanics that we can and some of the added loads that I can assist him or add to him. Okay, this is one of my favorites. These are our simulated rack pulls. You see Jan doing in the back here with a band. She's still learning how to do. Susan in the front. I'm doing a really um, a key presentation about Susan on Friday. Um, Susan could not bridge her own body weight when we started, meaning she couldn't lay down and do a bridge like Lauren just did. And now she can deadlift her body weight. And it was like a two and a half year process. And I'm going to go through all the steps that we took with her to get her to that. So Friday's talk is going to be pretty cool. But this was one of our like key lifts to do with her is just the simulated rack pull top of the knee up that little retraction up behind her shoulder blades. The bands are going to get a little lighter, a little heavier. So she's having to work a little harder as she comes up. She might be more vulnerable or more exposed in the back and the hip at the bottom. That's why we use the bands because it's lighter. The bar she's holding is my daughter's training bar. It's five pounds, right? So it's not heavy. It's just something that she can hang on to and learn the action. And as we get better with that, and we start to work into some consistent loads, uh, Gary inside the hex bar doing what we call a traditional rack pull. He can't go deeper than I know he's capable of lifting because I have the safety catches there, right? So he can lift to a depth that's about two to four inches short of where I'm going to see his back start to round or he's going to start to shift his knees too far forward. So I will put the, the catches, the range of motion stop about two or four inches above that. And then I can get this great uh, benefit of, of bone density, muscle, you know, over overload and stimulation, all the joint strength, everything I get from some pretty heavy load, 75 pound bar with an extra 20 on there, you know, so he's working close to hundred pounds with these rack poles in there. And that would kind of lead into a traditional deadlift off the floor for us. So kind of wrap things up for you for the day. Uh, number one, I want to thank Lauren for adding uh, so much great content to this and for her time uh, putting all this together to be in live in the studio. I know you stuck around for us for a few hours to do this. So thank you very much for that. 
um, some up and coming events. Um, we're not quite sure about FAI right now, if it's going to happen or not. If you're, if you're FAI followers, we're still trying to see when uh, a lot of the um, stay at homes and some of those are going to be lifted, if we're going to do the event or not. Uh, we had a pre-con, Evan and I set up to go through this whole arthritic training program of all the major joints and how we would do correctives and resistance for that. And if that does not happen, we're going to do it online. So I'd just like you to be aware of that sometime in May, June-ish, somewhere in there. We're definitely going to deliver that either way. And then this is kind of a special we've opened up since we are no longer doing section three of our course live in person because of all the travel restraints and everything going on. Uh, we've taken the whole thing online and we've reduced our price by $200. So we're happy to do payment plans. Anybody that wants to come and do this, here's your code here. And then one, you know, if you want to hop in and, and do our training course, I know we do have some more time at home right now, uh, depending on, on your business models and such. If you want to do something like that, I'm totally flexible to work with you. I'm not trying to gouge anybody financially, but if you want to invest on something like that, um, shoot me a message, let me know. We can work out whatever you want. And then Lauren, you want to talk a little bit about your teacher training you have coming up? Yeah, thank you so much, Robert. That's really cool that you're doing all that stuff. Um, yeah, the teacher training that we have here, um, we're actually a 500-hour school. We do every year, starting in September, a 200-hour teacher training. Um, we also have a lot of online classes that we're in the process of making. As Robert is saying, we've had to transition online really quickly. Right now, Yoga Alliance is not allowing a lot of their stuff online, but I just got an email and says that they're actually starting to correct that because of the way the world is changing. But I do have a teacher training starting up in September. It is a seven month long training. It only requires coming to Louisville one weekend a month. A lot of it is done on your own. There's a lot of online stuff that goes along with it. Um, but each weekend we have different topics and my teacher training is, is biomechanically based. Like we talked about, there's more anatomy in this train than any yoga training to date. Um, and we really work a lot to bring a lot of science to yoga. We do a lot with neuroplasticity, meditation, understanding about breath work, um, teaching, uh, teaching our, our students how to um, properly adjust a student. We actually teach poses by learning about the joints first, learning about mechanics, learning about forces before we ever even teach poses. And I'm very proud of the teachers that we've turned out. So if anybody is interested in coming to Louisville and taking this course, um, I can work anything out with you that you would like. Um, you know, as far as we, we don't really have a lot of payment plans or anything in place right now that if anybody listening to this course is interested in coming through the course, I'm more than happy to talk with you and try to work something out with you. Again, it goes from September all the way to March of 2021. So thank you for letting me plug that a little bit. Absolutely, yeah, thank you again for being on with us. And just to wrap things up here, right before we do some Q&A, we already had a couple of questions posted. Uh, we'll be on tomorrow at 11.30 uh, a.m. Pacific um, with Lindsay Bastola. Uh, former editor of PFP Magazine and uh, all around fitness badass. She's going to be sharing all kinds of great business education for us on um, kind of taking uh, the, the current situation that we're all in and, and really making great opportunities out of it. So she has been uh, busier than busy the last couple of days, multiple webinars a day. She's very versed in this. So I'm really excited to bring her on and chat with everybody. So make sure you pop on there and check that out. As I talked about earlier, the deadlift. Um, uh, progression that I'm going to do Friday and then uh, Lauren will be back along with a couple other uh, of, our, of our friends that will be on for the COVID and coffee our open forum on Saturday morning. Um, we did one of these two weeks ago. It was a little um, guided. I had some direction on, you know, are you getting ready to close? Are you closing? What to do now? That kind of thing. This is going to be purely just an open discussion. Whatever questions you have, you'll do a digital raise your hand. I'll call on you. You know, we'll let everybody kind of answer in Q&A, whatever you guys want. So feel free to hop on there, join us for that. And again, that one will be on demand too, if you're not able to make it live. Um, feel free to, uh, to uh, watch it afterwards. And Lauren, just to jump around here, couple of the questions that we have that have come up. Uh, we had one from Mary that said, um, when you're doing bird dogs, uh, are the hips supposed to be level? People always have one hip higher than the other, it seems like she says. Well, I think it's important to understand that there's a lot of little mixed rules that are out there and, and yoga is full of them. Um, typically we look at pictures of poses of people doing poses and we all sort of strive to look like that picture but nothing is going to be negative, negatively wrong. Nothing is going to hurt anyone if those hips don't remain level. The goal of keeping the hips level is to teach the person how to manage their body weight. If you do see the hips not being level, sometimes I'll do that on purpose. I'll tell someone to lower their hip on one side 
and then control it as we bring it back to level and just kind of going back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I want to keep the hips level for a specific purpose. Um, so, so really don't get so, so caught up in the rules of yoga instead of why am I doing this? What am I trying to strengthen? Because there's nothing that's going to hurt somebody if that hip drops, but it's definitely going to give you a lot of information in terms of whether or not that person might have some sort of a strength deficit in their core, in their shoulder girdle, or even in their hips that could be addressed not only with yoga, but other resistance training modalities. I hope that helps. The, the data feedback, that uh, observation that you get, you know, and you see somebody doing action, I'm, I'm downloading all that and seeing, okay, we've got a limitation here, an injury, the potential here. You know, you kind of see all that come in. So yeah, that can be a very good indicator of something else that's going on or something that needs to be uh, addressed. Right. Um, Rick, you asked, uh, where do you integrate flexibility training with resistance training? Um, with, with us, we do a, a very dynamic and, and, you know, dynamic mobility warm up at the beginning that if you watched it, you'd be like, this was pretty heavily inspired by some yoga stretches and yoga actions. Uh, we just do it in a, a, a dynamic, consistent movement flow because we are trying to stimulate blood flow and increase, you know, muscle temp temperature and such. And then we will use a lot of the isometric holds as active recoveries through our training programs. So we might have four or five exercises we do and then have a minute of active recovery where we'll ask them to, you know, to, to strike a, a different isometric or a different uh, position that they wanna try to integrate some holds or an active recovery stretch and mobility action, um, thoracic rotations, some of our bridges, uh, hip abductions and openers, warrior poses, such like that, that are basically allowing their um, cardiovascular system to recover or a muscle group area that we are addressing to recover uh, and rest while they're still doing something rather than just standing around. So Lauren, do you have anything to add on, on that? Yeah, I, I think that exactly what you said is, is right on point. And you notice that he didn't really mention just sitting on the floor and passively stretching. And I mm -hmm. think that that's wonderful that you're not doing that with your clients. And that's been my life's mission with my program is to teach people that, um, a lot of the reasons why people do have inflexibility is due to muscle weakness. So, you know, the things that Robert's discussing in his warm up about doing some of these just mobility exercises, doing integrated isometrics basically is what he's talking about. You know, we want to get the, we want to get our clients to visit their end ranges sometimes. If you think about what we do in the gym, typically when we start adding external loads, our ability to move our joint through its entire range of motion, that kind of goes down a little bit because we're dealing with a lot more force. So when we're dealing with body weight, we typically are able to move further into the range because we're not having anything up against us except for gravity, right? Mm -hmm. So when we think about going into some of these positions, such as you know, your classic you know, sit and reach or you know, supine hip flexion or you know, your back stretch and these things that people like to do, start thinking, what are the joints that are moving into this range actively and how do I set up a resistance scenario so that when this person goes into that end range of their joint, they're actually doing a positional isometric. So if they do that over time, the whole, if you read about the signs of isometrics, there's an isometric carryover effect, right? So if I do an isometric, let's say at 90 degrees of hip flexion, over time, assuming that I have the structure to deal with that, if my bones actually are able to move that far, I could actually increase my range of motion because I'm actually improving the ability of those muscles across the front of the hip to contract. So actually what you're asking, whenever someone asks me, is it a flexibility and how do I deal with flexibility? To me, whether you're doing yoga, whether you're doing strength training, power lifting, cycling, whatever, everything is resistance. It's all a matter of what you wanna do with the resistance and how do you want your muscles to respond? So I think if you look at it from that, that perspective, your warm-ups might consist of more body weight positional isometrics moving towards more of your traditional strength training exercises and even some of the things that Robert was showing you, which were very integrated with but different body parts moving in different ways to where now you're having to coordinate external loads as well as uh, movement patterns. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole spectrum of resistance training you can do with your client. And I think that if you, if you progress those safely, according to that individual over time, their strength and their range of motion should improve together. Great success there. You, you started off by mentioning static stretching. Uh, as, as new information has been released and new research on that, and I know Dean Somerset and a lot of these uh, other um, uh, Canadian experts that do research on this uh, have highlighted 
there's really zero benefit is what we're kind of seeing. It's other than it's a mental, it's a cognitive thing of like, this feels good. I enjoy it, but it's not actually producing increases in range of motion, um, real relaxing tactile reflexology, any of that, none of that is occurring. Um, so is that, do you, do you agree with that? hundred okay, um, percent. Yeah. Muscles are okay. not designed to stretch, you know, no. muscles pull. Muscles are designed to create tension. They're always under tension. So all of these stretches that people want a sensation, right? That's what they're looking for. They want to feel a sensation. We have this thing we do in our lectures, like, did I stretch? And I keep going back further and further. And then it's like, then I said, and I go, I'm like, oh, so stretching is a facial expression, you know? So, <laughs> now we're stretching. <laughs> right, now we're stretching. So, so really, you know, we, we, if we want to feel some sort of a sensation, that's a resistant scenario. And a lot of the reasons why people, again, if my hamstrings are tight, Maybe they need to be tight for the specific activities that I do during the day. If I'm a runner, I don't need to be able to bend over and touch my toes. Maybe my hip flexors have never been there before. So when we start to take people into these big stretching programs and try to improve flexibility just by having the muscles that are actually performing the range just sit there and do nothing but just get acted upon, it can not only do nothing, I'm going to say that it could actually make you less flexible. Yeah. And the risk of injury and especially if i'm going to have them come into the gym and do some of the things that you were fo focusing in on with all those different squatting motions which by the way i must say brilliant love it i think it's amazing what you're doing and it's so cool to see the older population doing deadlifts and squats and that's just wonderful to me um if you're going to do stuff like that why would you want to start them off with less neuromuscular input when you start picking up load you know doing an integrated isometric with uh, progressive resistance training is the way to go. And if we improve mobility, we have to improve stability at the same time. Having more mobility doesn't do anything for you if you can't control it. Absolutely. Totally yeah. agree. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, Robin asked about CECs, like for an ACE certification, et cetera. I'm, I'm assuming you're asking about our, our TOA. Yes, we have 1.6 CEUs. And then Lauren, do you have CEUs for your teacher course as well? Well, yeah, we're, right now we're just approved through Yoga Alliance, and obviously it's 200-hour continuing education credits, and we also have all wow. kinds of different, uh, yeah, we also yeah. have different, different other workshops that we, um, that we utilize. That they're also available for IAYT hours as well as Yoga Alliance. Um, we're looking into down the road, um, looking into getting some fitness uh, CEUs as well, but a lot of times what you can do, a lot of what my clients do is they'll partition it to the ACE and the NASM and, and the, um, you know, NSCA like you're from, yeah. and a lot of times can have that d piggyback. There you go. Uh, Bev, you asked about the, uh, the tricep extension pull down strap. So I went to Spud Incorporated and they have the strap on there. They have the pulley, um, they have the magic carpet. They've got all kinds of stuff that we use. You might see in some of our, our highlighted pieces. Now, when you go there, they're like a strongman facility. They're designed and there's guys picking up cars and, the, and you look at it, you're like, I'm in the wrong spot. You're not. They, they make really good durable product. And it doesn't matter to me who, you know, who's utilizing it. I need something that I can purchase once and it's going to last forever. And those are Kevlar straps. I mean, they're bulletproof straps. So, I mean, like you're, you're going to have a good quality product, but they're really soft. They're a great material to hold on to uh, that, that's really comfortable with the grip. So, yeah, Spud Incorporated, check them out. Um, great webinar. Thank you, Annie. Becky Williams, fantastic. Great presentation. Thank you. Scott asked, uh, have you noticed that meditation has impacted your strength training? Do you think that being mindful uh, during strength training is impactful? Your breathing, your awareness practices, meditation, yoga during your strength training components. Where does this all fit in? So on, on my end, there, there's been some really good research that has talked about I forget the terminology they use, but it's a mindful connection to the muscle group while you're doing the muscle action. So basically while doing a bicep curl, I'd be visualizing my biceps. I'd be thinking about my bicep activation and I would go through that range of motion, trying to make a mental mind connection to that muscle while I'm training it. And there were performance output improvements that were significant. That was more than five or 8%, I believe. And remember study wise, it's like two and a half percent is significant. So to get like five or 8%, somewhere around in there, I don't think it was quite 10. That was significant when you're looking at, 
you know, people that are training performance or that are bodybuilders or whatever it is in that sense. You know, some of the other ones you've seen like blood flow restriction with the bands and all this, a lot of these other things were way less than that. So just making a mental mind connection to a muscle group, thinking about it, focusing on that and trying to keep that connection there was showing you know, extra reps or extra load that was being able to, to be moved or applied or reps that were achieved that when they were mindless in doing so, mindless meaning thinking about singing along the music, having a conversation, it wasn't as significant. So I think when you're really looking at like a, a mind, mindful meditative set while strength training, that can be a route to go through. But are you going to find like your center light and be able to focus and zone out when you're trying to do power cleans or deadlifts. Like, I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if that's what you're asking, but you know, in my mind, having that connection of the muscle group that you're training, I think there'd be a great significant there. Lauren, what do you think? Oh, I completely agree with what you're saying. Um, there's a lot of great books out there. I would recommend the book um, biology of belief is a great one to read. Mm -hmm. um, it talks a lot. The author's name is Bruce Limpton. And he basically said that, you know, whatever environment that your, you know, your thoughts are bathed in is what's going to actually bring about your reality. So there's actual studies that, you know, when someone gets up in the morning and they start putting on their exercise clothes, you know, their heart rate starts to elevate, their blood pressure starts to go up. They actually start to, you know, their, their hormones start to generate, the, the endorphins start to, start to hype up. And that's sort of what gives us the impetus to go, to, go through a workout. When we are present, when we are mindful of what we're doing, when we're quote unquote paying, the definition of mindfulness is to pay attention on purpose. When we're really paying attention, we really, not only the, the, the physical part of what we're doing, literally every molecule in your body will line up to make something happen. Mm -hmm. When people go to the gym and they don't really want to be there, they're doing, their, they're doing something to avoid getting fat or I'm doing something because I hate being here. They literally have found that the dopamine levels that normally release an exercise do not open. They, those channels do not release. Oh, because wow. we're absolutely not thinking about what we should be thinking about. When we're really focused and we're very mindful, they've actually, there's a, there's a whole science, I'm sure you've heard of it, called neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. They actually changed the, the anatomy of our brain and realized that, you know, just because we're lifting a weight and we think that we're, you know, doing a lat pull down, it doesn't necessarily mean that your brain is firing the lats. If you study biomechanics, our body has such a great ability to compensate and to not participate and hand off exercises to all other kinds of muscles in our body. You can watch a bodybuilder on stage when they're actually performing isometrics during their pose downs when they're really trying to focus on how do I sit here and just make my bicep fire. Those guys are working so hard and they're right. basically doing yoga, you know, trying to get these muscles to fire one on one. And when you actually put an intention and an effort into your training mechanisms, your results are gonna improve tenfold over somebody that's not paying attention, like Robert was saying, and just listening to the music and talking to their friends and just going through the motions and counting reps, right? It is absolutely imperative to have your, your, your trainers start to work on both mindfulness, meditation, and breathing practices, not to mention the fact that doing deep breathing and meditation, when we get our brain and our core muscles working, we're gonna have more force output to be able to lift more weights. You guys see why I brought her on here now? <laughs> Science and yoga, man. I dig it. Thank well, you. I think that's that's about everything we've gone through. I got a lot of thank yous and a lot of great jobs. So thank you, everybody, for uh, making those uh, messages, sending those messages for us. Lauren, thank you again for being on here with us. This was awesome. Uh, we should do it again sometime. I appreciate it. Everybody, thank you for your time. Thank you for being on. And uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, tomorrow and the rest of the week as we go through and finish our TOA Education Week. If you have any other questions, comments, uh, I had uh, Lauren's uh, Instagram was on the PDF there. You can look her up uh, from her business title one more time, Lauren. Yoga Integrated Science. Yoga Integrated Science. You can look her up on there or uh, with me, just my name on Instagram there or our websites as well. And uh, we appreciate you all. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you again, Lauren. And we'll Thank talk to you all soon. Absolutely. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.